offer some final thoughts on what we've heard today and on where the project will go from here. Um, and then, as I say, I'll give everybody a chance to uh, say uh, now, final words of wisdom if you feel like it, and then we can uh, we can take a break before before champagne. Is that it? Yeah, we're supposed to have champagne soon. Trevor, thank you uh, very much, Louise, and thank you everyone for uh, participating today. I think this, these panels have certainly given us a lot of uh, food for thought for our continuing uh, research agenda. And there were just a few points that I want to highlight that I thought came out of today's panels. Uh, you may or may not disagree, but we'll be taking these away and thinking about these uh, very seriously. The first thing I thought came from Elizabeth Dowdwell's presentation, and I was incredibly impressed by the care with which her consultation process was conducted uh, within Canada uh, on the issue of nuclear waste. And it occurs to me that very same model involving all stakeholders in a very careful, open, deliberative process can also be used to consider the issue of nuclear energy generally. And in particular, from our project's point of view, in considering how uh, global governance should be adjusted in the light of nuclear energy developments. Uh, the point was made, uh, I think, particularly strikingly when we talked about fuel assurances, that any regime that designs fuel assurances should take into account not just the provider's views and the provider's regulations and stipulations, but also the views of those on the receiving end of the assurances. So this regime should be constructed with all parties involved to arrive at a mutually agreeable a solution to the fuel assurance problem. <clears throat> and it occurs to me that the internal Canadian process led by uh, Elizabeth Dowdswell is an excellent model that we can adapt to uh, global governance uh, problems, uh, particularly in this nuclear area. A second thing that struck me was the very different perspectives that countries bring to their nuclear energy uh, problems and their energy problems in general. It was very striking, for instance, how Japan views the economics of its nuclear industry uh, compared to how the United States does. And indeed, uh, we just heard uh, most recently about the case of Australia. Clearly, there are some values that the Japanese internalize within their estimation of the value of nuclear power that probably uh, would not be acceptable in a country that ha had a vast, vast amounts of energy, much more than Japan does. So a country that is uh, resource poor places a higher value on the sorts of nuclear um, reprocessing, those sorts of activities, than a, than a country with uh, vast amounts of natural uranium and indeed alternative energy sources. So I think in our project we'll be looking at the vast array of views that can be had on the nuclear issue depending on uh, the particular country's own domestic circumstances. And I think that's a, that's a very important thing we need to bear in mind. We can't paint all countries with the same uh, brush in terms of their consideration of the value of nuclear power because some, some values, particularly social values that can't have a, finger, uh, a figure put on them, uh, certainly uh, are valued differently by different countries. A third uh, point that struck me is that even though we talk about a renaissance, uh, we're not quite in it yet and the very long lead times, uh, the various shortages of fuel, uh, of uh, technology and of uh, technical uh, expertise will delay this renaissance no, how, no matter how uh, urgent it is perceived and no matter how fast governments want to go on this. And it also strikes me that the regulatory framework will either facilitate or hold back uh, developments depending on um, the country concerned. I was particularly struck by Japan's case where internal self-regulation of safety has in fact uh, done the opposite of a level playing field and actually put Japan at somewhat of a disadvantage, but because of their sensitivity to, to accidents and the, the self-perceived need for more inspections, that this somehow creates a different uh, situation in Japan to, say, uh, the United States or Canada. So, so again, I think uh, we need to be very careful when we talk about the Renaissance, and our project will be quite careful uh, in characterizing exactly what sort of renaissance this, this is. 
Another point on the technical issues, it's clear that the reaction from uh, Ed Lyman's presentation that the technical issues are still very much uh, contested. And uh, while our project doesn't really have to resolve these, we do have to bear in mind that within particular countries, as they make their national uh, energy policies uh, clearer, that these technical issues will be contested and that they, decisions about the technical issues can't take place in a, in a technical vacuum. It has to be done in terms of the social values and, and, the, uh, and in particular the economics, of course. Uh, on, the, on the economics question itself, it struck me yesterday from the presentation by the gentleman from Goldman Sachs that uh, if we still don't have a very good handle on how much energy it takes to produce a given volume of energy from uranium, then we clearly have a few more questions for the economists and those who figure out these, uh, these matters. And that, that strikes me as, as something our project will be very interested in, just how economic is uh, uh, uranium from the point of view of the amount of energy that you need uh, to actually produce a given amount of energy from uranium. And I guess the Alberta tar sands is, is the example that's uh, sitting in my head there. It seems to me that the whole question of uh, assurances of supply and the various regime proposals we've heard about today is a very fertile field for research. Uh, examining the costs and benefits of each individual uh, proposal, but also seeing what compatibility is, there is between various uh, proposals and how these might be constructed uh, into a, a regime. But again, with, with all the stakeholders um, involved. Uh, so I think I would uh, end on, on the note that our project's goal is not to resolve all these uncertainties. Uh, we have to simply try and determine how governments themselves will face, face these uncertainties and how they will make decisions about to proceed or not with nuclear power. And then in turn, how these uh, decisions collectively will have an impact on global governance. So we're very excited about the sorts of ideas that have already come to us from Joe Serencioni and others about the next stage of our project, which is the impact on global governance. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to draw on the expertise of all our panels and uh, you amongst the audience who are interested in this issue uh, as we, we go forward. We hope to be running uh, draft ideas uh, past various stakeholders and various uh, interest groups uh, as we move towards the conclusion of the proposal. So we're hoping that uh, you who are interested in this issue, this issue can be uh, involved in that process. So thank you very much for your participation uh, and for attending today's uh, sessions. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Thank you, Trevor, for uh, for drawing um, a number of very uh, very important points that will be reflected in the next phase of our work. I would like to add just two considerations: is that as I was listening to all the presentation, uh, it was clear to me that, that whether we were looking at a small renaissance or a large renaissance, that there are issues of global governance. Uh, that uh, uh, require attention. That's one conclusion. And secondly, that even if uh, Joe Terencioni's uh, very uh, optimistic and uh, I, must, I must say very stimulating view of where we are at with respect to non-proliferation problems, that even if we solve all these non-proliferation problems through total disarmament, there will continue to be nuclear power plants around the world that have to be operated safely and securely and that do not endanger uh, the life or safety or security not only of the citizens of the country where they're located, but also uh, in neighboring countries, hence a set of, uh, of global governance issues that exist beyond the non-proliferation concern, which is admittedly the most, uh, the most complicated and the most frightening part of the global governance concerns, but there are others that will continue to uh, require attention. And I thought that Edwin uh, Lehman's, uh, Lyman's presentation this morning, uh, even though some people thought he was too negative on nuclear uh, energy, I think was a useful reminder that even 
uh, in a country that that prides itself in in uh, in its record of safety and the care it is given to managing its nuclear industry uh, still uh, has not achieved per perfection. Uh, and that suggests that uh, internationally as well, I doubt that we have achieved a perfect global governance uh, uh, system to ensure the safe uh, operation of, of nuclear power plants. That will uh, be it for my own uh, two cents worth at the end of this extraordinarily interesting day from my perspective. I turn the floor over to you if you have, Gerald? Yes. Thanks. Jerry Wright from the National Electricity Roundtable. Uh, it's been an excellent day. Uh, just one or two undoubtedly Pekayun comments about your framework. I wasn't entirely clear uh, what you regarded as the optimum result and therefore what the criterion would be that you would be using in assessing the governance mechanisms. I know we all want a safer world, but uh, I, I, it seems to me that the objective has to be uh, presented in a little more detailed fashion than if the the investigation of the governance mechanisms is going to yield a really uh, useful and interesting um, uh, result. Secondly, um, taking off from Trevor's um, uh, remarks about whether maybe the uh, uh, nuclear renaissance isn't going to be as, uh, as uh, substantial as we might think, I think it's quite uh, revealing sometimes that national projections, such as our own in Canada's or the uh, US DOE's, are often uh, much more cautious uh, about, about nuclear, uh, in, as in the case of the US DOE, uh, even in, uh, a Department of Energy that's under the Bush administration, that must take into consideration what it considers to be uh, constraints that are more substantial than uh, some of the uh, euphoric nuclear enthusiasts would, uh, would have us uh, believe. And I wondered in that connection whether your, uh, your framework is missing reference to the supply mix, which surely must be a determinant of many jurisdictions' decision as to whether or not they're going to go nuclear. Uh, take, for example, the province of Nova Scotia, uh, which has a requirement of about 2,200 megawatts. If they were to opt for a nuclear plant, uh, that would mean knocking out about 600 uh, megawatts at least of generation. It would probably subvert their objective to uh, have diversity of, of energy sources, it would be a quite un, impractical decision for them to, to take. And it seems to me that the supply mix uh, would figure in the decision of many jurisdictions as to whether or not they would opt for nuclear technology. Sure. Thanks, uh, Jerry, very much. Uh, just on the question of criteria you talked about, I think it really depends from the global governance perspective on which area we would be looking at. We're dividing it into uh, safety, security, and non-proliferation. And I think if we look at each of those three areas, we're going to be having different criteria on what we think is a valid goal. Uh, clearly, our criteria won't be perfection. I think that's impossible. Uh, in, the, in the area of safety and security, for instance, I can imagine we would have some criteria, at least uh, with regard to globalizing uh, uh, the regulatory framework so that safety and security at least is at a certain minimum level uh, in countries around the world rather than being up to governments themselves to choose their own level. That will be the sort of criteria I think we would be looking at in those areas. Uh, in the area of non-proliferation, I think we would be looking at the question of how to uh, strengthen the non-proliferation regime in a way that is uh, acceptable on the basis of equity. At the moment, one of the huge barriers to making uh, what I think is a reasonable non-proliferation regime uh, move towards uh, greater universality is this idea that it not be discriminatory. So one of the criteria, not, one of the criteria we'll be using in that non-proliferation area is, is the standard we are seeking, are the uh, proposals for improvement we're seeking uh, acceptable broadly or more broadly than they are now to the international community. So do they take the sting out of the discriminatory nature of the current system? Are they more equitable than they currently are? As I say, I'm not sure we can aim for perfection in any of these, these three areas, but uh, certainly we will be looking for um, greater universalization, greater acceptance uh, of the various 
uh, groups of states developing and developed those with nuclear power, those without, uh, than, than currently exists. We're still um, in the early days, as it were, of moving on to the global, global governance part of the project, but uh, certainly uh, criteria is something we'll have to consider, obviously. We, we won't be doing this in a criteria-free vacuum. Uh, just on the supply mix decisions, uh, uh, you're absolutely right. Countries will have to think about nuclear not in an either-or context, but in terms of the mix of energy that they're looking at. Uh, that's something that we ourselves don't have to determine. We, we simply have to find out uh, to what extent countries are seeking nuclear as part of their mix, whether it's going to go up and down de depending on how they view their mix, um, and then arriving at some assessment of the way the, the, uh, the collectivity, if you like, of, of states are moving towards nuclear or, or moving away. So I, I think the, the question of supply mix is, is implied in the way that we'll be looking at how national energy policies uh, evolve and what conclusions they arrive at. Given, given also that they're a moving target, I mean, in some ways we've set ourselves an impossible task. We're trying to look two decades ahead as to where the nuclear situation will be. And in the meantime, as, as the case of Australia illustrates, countries can go back and forward and wax and wane on this issue. So uh, it, is, it is a difficult uh, job we've set ourselves. Any other thoughts? Yes, Eginder. Thank you. Two very brief comments. Uh, one is on the economics that you mentioned. Uh, and I've done some work on it. Uh, the microphone? Sorry? Speak in the microphone so we can yeah. hear you. I've done some work on it uh, in India where we had to price uh, a reactor which was made by one monopoly corporation and sold to a generating monopoly corporation. And they're very substantial learning costs. And if you take them off, then the marginal cost is very different. Second, there were very different cost estimates from what we did at home mm -hmm. as compared to what one of the two, there are basically two vendors at that point of time. So the international market was very different from the kind of cost estimates we made. And uh, today my Chinese colleague was telling me that they have produced, uh, uh, they are getting into, the, he was telling us, a 60 megawatt fast breeder reactor from the nuclear route. And we have produced one 40 megawatts based on the thorium route. And there have been very interesting exercises done, some of which I've reported in this working paper uh, which for SIGI, which I used yesterday, on how you derive marginal cost estimates for producing a unit of electricity. Mm -hmm. And I would recommend for your consideration that we do that very carefully because most of the cost-benefit economics would work out very differently uh, depending on the way we look at it. And But fortunately, there is some data available now with which we can do that. Uh, the second was the very interesting uh, presentation today by Dr. Do uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Doudswell. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've also done something like this in the whole area of uh, irrigation projects, a large national consultation, because we have a lot of contentious kinds of things going on mm -hmm. there. And I was asked to chair it. I'm supposed to be a big dam wala, but Mela Patkar was also there. And interestingly, Dr. Doudswell said something that when, you know, the safety issue, she was able to really get through and there's government acceptance. And these transparent procedures are really helpful. And so what she, as you said, what she said was very useful. But when you get into more controversial issues, the best that you can do in these kinds of processes is only to jot the alternative viewpoints because people feel so strongly on them and try as you can it becomes very difficult to get conclusions based on data and in response to some questions she also said the same thing she said you know on these kinds of issues we have simply listed what the alternative views are so i think uh, that will be a very interesting problem that you will be facing as you go along since you're using that and i think very rightly so as an instrument in this project Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that, that's very helpful. I, I think on the calculation of marginal costs, what will be important to us is how uh, national policymakers perceive their own calculations. Uh, presumably, they're, in, they're influenced in, in global calculations and perhaps the calculations of others as regards their own country. But ultimately, it's how they perceive their calculations and how they make 
their national policy decisions based on those. So I think there are varied calculations, but ultimately the one that influences national energy policy is the one that's of most interest to us. And uh, uh, on, uh, on your... If I can take one sentence on that. Sure. My teacher got the Nobel Prize in econometrics, so I hope we can do a little better than just what governments say. <laughs> indeed. indeed. Um, you made some comments about uh, Elizabeth Dowdswell's presentation. Uh, I, mean, I entirely agree there will be issues that are so divisive that you simply cannot choose one extreme position or the other. But, but I think Elizabeth made the point that often it's useful uh, to those advocating a position which is eventually not adopted, that at least it's clear that their view has been heard. And uh, I think she even mentioned that at the end, even after the decision had been made which didn't quite meet the extremes, to have them there when the decision was being announced and still presumably open to further discussion down the track was, was very useful. Th these decisions tend not to be yes or no anyway. They're ongoing evolution of national energy policy. So that, that's, that's my interpretation, Elizabeth, of what, of what you said, but that seems to me... Uh... I have uh, Bill Graham. Well, I think we were all very uh, delighted by the note of optimism we got at lunchtime from Mr. Cerenzioni, uh, uh, but uh, an optimism which uh, largely was predicated on a series of changes in the United States and in U.S. politics and driven by U.S. politicians. Uh, having, had the having had the experience of sitting in Geneva through some of the most depressing and in inscrutable and never-ending discussions around these issues where nothing ever got done, not only because the United States was blocking at every turn, but because China was blocking what the United States was blocking, which what Russia was blocking, which was, well, we had well-meaning powers like Canada and others running around trying to put together things. So, you know, the presentation was great, but it's predicated on solving the Middle East crisis, uh, a few other items as well. But I think However, it, it's really worthy of, of our consideration as a roadmap that goes ahead. So is it a, a reasonable suggestion to the center that one might build upon the roadmap that he laid out by going to some of the other players that will be necessary because Washington will not determine this. It's going to be how others determine the re react to Washington's proposals. And even if you made all the assumptions he gave us at lunch, could we, would it be worth our considering what the reactions of the Chinese, the Russians, and other, the essential other players, Israel amongst them, would be to any such scenarios before we got believing that this is anywhere near likely? Well, I think Joe, Joe was still in the room. <laughs> <laughs> would probably like to clarify. Not only do I think that's a good idea, I would say that's an, that's an essential idea. Uh, number one, you can't count on the United States. Number two, other players are already doing this. I'm, I'm quite struck by the, uh, the, the leaders project I just learned about that, that's being launched partially from, from CG. This is a terrific idea. Norway is working, they're working, they have their own idea for a global summit in, in 2010. There's something called the Middle Powers Initiative that involves a, a number of countries. These things are, as we, as we, these, these things are in motion. You know, and new, as I said, new leadership is emerging. Gordon Brown has got a very different set of policies from Tony Blair. I was uh, present at the Carnegie Endowment this summer in June when the outgoing foreign minister, uh, Mr. Uh, 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 Margaret Beckett, uh, made an incredible speech on this subject, by far the most forward-leaning speech of any, of any foreign minister or secretary of state that I'd seen, and she had this blessed by Gordon Brown. These people want to do things. There is leadership in other countries, as we just heard, we may have a new Australian leadership soon. This leadership is emerging, there's a, there's a, there's a role for this. I just emphasize the United States because number one, I'm, I'm American, and number two, it's been the biggest part of the problem. I mean, it's been U.S. policy that has blocked many of the things that, that, that we've wanted. And with the collapse of that, the neoconservative paradigm, it now opens up this space where once again these ideas can contend. There's no guarantee that, that our solutions will prevail, but we have this opportunity 
as I say, for the next two or three years to make them prevail. So I strongly endorse your initiative. Right. Ramesh? Just uh, picking up and uh, running with the same team, uh, Trevor, you, you summarized your three strands as safety, security, and uh, non-proliferation. As, and the comments are, I suppose, to both of you, and we'll have these debates internally too later on, I'm sure. Uh, but as we know, the choice of language in framing an issue can be very critical and politically very consequential. Uh, we certainly had that with the old debate over humanitarian intervention. Every time we use that language, the war was lost even before the normative battle could be engaged. I think you have the same risk if you frame it like that. Uh, it would be much better to frame it, the third one, as weaponization rather than non-proliferation. Because I don't think it is possible to separate non-proliferation and disarmament, linking it back to the lunchtime uh, discussion. If weapons exist, they will proliferate. If you want non-proliferation, pursue disarmament. The policy implication of that then is that you, you don't separate the two. And if you do focus only on one side of the equation, the, all the old decades of accumulated suspicion about the nuclear apartheid agenda will come back. I don't think it's necessary to the project. Weaponization is a more neutral, politically more neutral term in that term, in that sense. And I think it is a better way of framing it rather than saying we are going to talk about non-proliferation and not disarmament. Thanks, uh, Ramesh. I think that's actually a useful uh, thing to suggest for the project because, in a sense, we've chosen these th three terms as working titles. We're not absolutely wedded to them. But I would just add it seems very unfortunate that over the decades the term non-proliferation has come to be skewed from its original meaning. It was really meant to refer to vertical proliferation, the acquisition of weapons increasingly by states that already had them, plus the spreading of weapons to those who didn't. And over recent years, non-proliferation has come to mean only stopping further states from acquiring nuclear weapons. So in some ways, I'd prefer our project to re-seize the uh, original meaning of the term non-proliferation to mean that the nuclear weapon states themselves need to do something about the problem by paying attention to their obligations under Article 6 of the MPT on nuclear disarmament. Uh, we can consider the term weaponization, but it would sit rather oddly with safety and security, which tend to be positive uh, words in the lexicon, whereas weaponization has a rather negative one. But I take the general thrust of your point that we shouldn't be wedded to terminology if it's inappropriate, and, uh, and indeed if it scares the horses, then that's simply uh, not appropriate for the project. So uh, I think that's certainly wise that we should uh, think very carefully about our working titles. I go small. Thank you. Uh, just two comments generally directed towards the research project, things you might want to bring out in the project or um, in future colloquium. The first is sort of pedestrian, more conventional. The second is a little more way out. The first is very almost, there was, I think, one bullet on one slide referring to uh, the shortage of skilled human resources in terms of ramping up the number of nuclear power plants or even the refurbishing of nuclear power. Um, from what I've heard anecdotally from other people in a few other presentations, this is a major bottleneck, and I mention this because we're sitting in uh, next to Canada's foremost engineering faculty in the place with, where you know, the people who will be needed to run and refurbish the existing, never mind the world, just Ontario's own nuclear power plants sit. And I really wonder how many new nuclear engineers are being graduated or will be graduated. That's a constraint all by itself. I'm sure the IAEA looks at it, but it might be worth bringing out a bit in the future. Mm -hmm. It may also have a bit more of a bearing on international cooperation as well of a soft but important kind in terms of training nuclear engineers and, and skilled engineers personnel in, in other countries that are looking to develop a nuclear energy option or rely on nuclear energy from other countries. So that would be worth elaborating. The second is far much further out, but I was just thinking, what's the future intersection of any evolution of global governance around nuclear energy and any evolution of global governance around climate change? I mean. Whatever emerges post-2012, assuming something does, is going to have to manage, ultimately, some kind of global cap-and-trade system and emissions permitting and all the rest of it. 
and will increasingly have driven behind it some notion of climate security which has been put out and will become more and more evident as the impact of climate change becomes more evident. So there will be more of an intersection between this particular future wedge which has got incredible complexities and the whole everything else that we have to do on climate change and I simply say that as you finish your project even a little bit of speculation on the intersection between not one but two incredibly complex issues would be a, a great point of departure. Uh, thank you Michael. As, as Trevor knows very well uh, one of my mantra is to try to keep the project within manageable terms because indeed uh, through this project one can tackle very broad issues and therefore we have a choice to make. That's why I think we've made very clear this is not about providing the ultimate analysis as to whether or not there's going to be a, a nuclear renaissance, how big, don't have a very, very detailed economic analysis. The, the, the first part of the project is to get enough, enough of, a, of a picture of the various scenarios possible, how big, what kind of technology, to allow us to focus in a realistic way on governance problem. But even when we look at governance problem, we will have to decide where we draw the line. Are we going to talk about governance problem uh, in a way as to include the related governance challenges? How far are we going to go down the line of talking about disarmament and, and the political challenges of dealing with, uh, with Iran or North Korea or whatever, we will have at some point to draw lines because the ultimate purpose of this project is to propose publicly practical steps that governments that care about um, safe and secure use of of a, uh, a nuclear power that they can take and promote internationally, starting with our own government. Um, and therefore, we'll have to make some choices and draw some lines, but I found the discussion very, uh, very illuminating as to how big a challenge we'll have <laughs> in, in deciding where we draw the line, because indeed, you have certainly helped me to make a lot of connections uh, that will inevitably have to be addressed when we uh, when we come down to preparing our our final recommendations. Uh, I have uh, yes. Could I just make a point on the question of skilled uh, personnel? I think I did have it on my uh, PowerPoint, and, and I think that's certainly a factor in the expansion of the nuclear industry. But even more worrying from a global governance perspective, there's going to be a skilled uh, skill shortage in relation to the IAEA and International Inspectorate if we have a vast expansion of nuclear energy and all these plans have to be safeguarded, uh, the agency will have to vastly increase its recruitment. It's already, as I understand it, facing block obsolescence, if you want to use that term, in relation to its inspectorate who came from an entirely different generation. So there already you have a skill shortage, not just in the industry, but in, in safeguarding and verifying uh, the responsible uh, practices of the industry. And I think our project may even come out with proposals that we increase um, things like uh, inspections when it comes to safety and security, as well as non-proliferation. So that, in turn, would require uh, yet another inspectorate and, indeed, more skills. So it is a serious problem from both sides of the, the scale, if you like. And Salima? And then I think I can hear sh champagne corks. Yeah. As, as, we, as we are looking into the future, may I come back to a, an allusion Monsieur Giscard d'Estaing made when he, when he said uh, goodbye to us before leaving. And this is, I would like to refer to this project ITER, fusion energy as the new source for the, for the future. Uh, there is a, a group of countries, uh, European Union, um, Japan, Russia, meanwhile, India and others, uh, the United States joined at a later stage, have uh, started to build a multi-billion project in the south of France. This is a European project, uh, but it, uh, France was chosen. I won't go into the details, but I want, want to mention that Canada, though no longer 
playing a role actively now, has a very honorable and important uh, well, history in this, in this game. I have had the pleasure to, the privilege to be in this uh, discussion as well. This is why I tell you, uh, if Canada at the time would not have presented a side proposal, uh, there was the great danger that the whole uh, negotiation process would have collapsed. Meanwhile, uh, I would suggest that we see this as a realistic alternative to uh, fission reactors. It is the idea that you imitate the production of energy which is pro uh, uh, produced in, by in the, on the sun. Uh, he heat, uh, uh, the, the pressure, everything is imitated and you, you, get, you get energy without needing uranium, without uh, having to fear uh, the same radiation or, uh, or uh, uh, the waste prob problem. The idea is that within 40 years, a uh, reactor, will, the codon called reactor and machine, will be ready to start production of energy. And then uh, a second 20 years period, then there will be a, a demonstration reactor. And then it should be commercially viable. It is the future, but I would propose that when you look into this, you should not forget the future in comparison to the near future. And, and think about the very important role Canada has played. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, final question. Hello. I'm Nick Petten from the University of Waterloo. I'm an undergraduate student. And I was wondering within your respective organizations how you might be influencing and motivating young leaders to take responsibility for the future energy um, concerns. Um, well, you will be happy to know that a number of young people are associated with my with, with the project. I think there's a, a couple of people based here in Waterloo and, and there's a small team as well based in, uh, in Ottawa with, uh, with Trevor who are going to be involved in the, um, in the, in the research. So um, uh, I hope that this will give us um, a chance to uh, to see how the younger generation sees problem because clearly uh, people of my generation have already decades of uh, of familiarity with a certain way of seeing the world seeing how problems come up and uh, and your generation may have a different uh, a, a different set of preoccupations and may see may see the same problems from a different angle so yes we do have we do have young people um, uh, involved in in the project. Uh, this is, of course, a, a project that does not involve public consultation. It's well beyond our capacity to do what Elizabeth Dowdswell uh, has done on the the issue of uh, nuclear waste uh, disposal. Uh, our project is more modest, and it's more modest in uh, in resources. That said, uh, just as the conference today uh, was open to a number of uh, of students from uh, from Waterloo, uh, we will certainly try to bear that in mind when we organize. Um, a few other events of of uh, of, uh, of of a comparable size. We may have one more event in, in in the life of the project where we will be in a position to have a significant number of, of people in a conference setting, and we certainly will will uh, will try to ensure that we have uh, we have students who, who care and are interested. More broadly speaking, the purpose of the, the project that we've, uh, we've initiated is um, in part to generate a bit of discussion in Canada on these issues. It's, um, it's not very much on our radar screen at the moment publicly. Uh, I think we have every reason as a country that has ample resources in uranium and sell on the, on, on the market a country that has 
nuclear technology and, and, and certainly exports its technology as a country that uh, has had forever a very, very uh, strong policies on, on uh, non-proliferation. Uh, there's a there's there's a base there to uh, make Canada um, a voice that matters in these debates, and uh, in all, in very modestly, I hope that the report we produce will be one of the uh, one of the ways in which Canadian population's attention is brought to the complex issues related to nuclear energy and, uh, and, and, and proliferation concerns and global governance concerns and that it will contribute in a modest way to, uh, to generating uh, debate and, and make people better aware of the, uh, of the issues that are involved in, uh, in this particular set of problems. If there is no one else asking for the floor, I just want to conclude this day by uh, first thanking our outstanding panelists and speakers. I think you will agree with me that we have uh, been really lucky to have such high quality presentations which uh, I think have generated um, very high quality exchanges between the audience. So I guess I should compliment the audience too, but I've rarely seen such uh, coherent dialogue in, in a large group like that uh, on issues that are, after all, pretty complex. It would, have, it would have allowed us to be all over the map, but in fact, thanks to the high quality of the, uh, the presentations that we've had, I think we've kept our focus all day, and that's, uh, that's uh, really very rewarding for, uh, for us, and I want to thank, therefore, all our panelists, our lunchtime speaker, uh, and all of you. But I want to reserve my final thanks to, uh, to Trevor and his assistant Scott Bluff with uh, Morgan and the little team that's now working on the project. You now understand why, uh, why I said at the beginning that I thought I'd found the perfect project director. Um, he, uh, Trevor and, and, and his little team were entirely responsible for, uh, for putting together this day, for, for identifying the speakers and for making sure that, uh, that we had a, a vision of what this day should accomplish and I think it certainly met all our expectations. So Trevor, thank you very much and I want to, uh, to thank you all. For